afternoon, friends. We come to you from the fountain in the city, Church Friendly. We may not be in our usual place of prayer, but we are still a friendly. We come to you from different um, uh, places at the moment. Our team that is producing uh, this live stream is in different places. Uh, our pastor, um, pastor team that has just been praying a moment ago is in his house somewhere in the, um, uh, maybe towards the north of Sydney and I'm in the southwest of Sydney and others are in the north of Sydney. We are all producing this together. We want to thank God for um, this beautiful gift of technology. You know, we used to talk about gifts uh, and think of the gift of music, the gift of preaching and the gift of, um, say, leadership or evangelism. But little did we know that there is yet another gift. Um, let me read to you that gift before we get into our message. It's found in Exodus chapter 31. These are the gifts of the spirits, of the spirits that God gave to his church. You find most of them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in Ephesians chapter 4. But hey, there is one in Exodus chapter 31 that I just want to introduce to you today as we as I welcome you. It's found in Exodus chapter 31, and I read from verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. So this is actually something that is coming from the Holy Spirit. In wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge, in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels, for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. So this guy, uh, Bezalel, Bezalel, had a gift of, of, of um, a technical gift of working with his hands. And we've got people that have such a gift among us, and we can see that that gift, more than ever, is being put to use. I just want to thank God for people uh, with gifts of technology, where I'm not quite tech savvy myself, but there are people who can put this together and the, the gospel can be preached right under the, especially at a time like this. I know as I come to you, even at a time like this, uh, there are some perhaps who have been affected directly or indirectly, indirectly by, by this virus. I just wanna, I just wanna, I pray with you in mind, and this message really comes to you at such a time, and it is entitled, Under His Wings. As we think of that, let me just read to you our, our opening text that is found in chapter 23 of the book of Matthew, chapter 23, Matthew, and I'm reading from verse 37. Matthew 23, and the verse is 37. If you have a red letter version, you will know that that red letter, the words are in red, meaning they came, they came, these are words that came out of the mouth of Jesus. I read in the NKJV. I want you to pick the emotion of Jesus. He says these words. Here it is. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Let us pray. Father, your children are under attack at this moment in time. The battle is raging. The devil is angry knowing that his time is short. Father, send us a word of comfort. Remind us that you want to keep us under your wings. And Father, I just want to thank you for the gift of technology. May you hold it together and hold the hands of those that have gifts in this, in this department, that we can run through the message at a time like this. Be with us now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, my friends, a story is told of a woman who came to a petrol station after fueling her car, she goes into the little fuel petrol station kiosk to pay for the fuel that she had put in. She remembers very well as she entered into that, into that, into that, into that shop, into that little shop, that she meets with this 
really rough looking men, men that had bloodshot eyes, looking like he was a murderer. And she remembers that she had to give way to let him pass because she was afraid of this man. And this man walks right over, to, um, um, and this lady walks right over to the, to the counter and she pays. As she is pulling out her purse, she looks through the window, she sees this scary man jumping into that 16 wheeler truck. And she takes a mental note of this man and the truck that, she, that he's getting into. She finishes paying, she gets out of the shop and then she jumps onto his car, off she drives. She's only driving a few seconds down the road when she looks into the rear view mirror and right behind her was the 16 wheeler driving and following her. She thinks, no, this man is not following me. He's just going somewhere where he's going. And she takes a left turn and the 16 wheeler takes a left turn. By this time, she is suspicious that the man is following her. And she says to her mind, let me take a right turn just to make sure. Let me get into this street here. And she takes a right turn and the 16 wheeler takes a right turn. And then she's, she comforts herself and she says, maybe, maybe he's just going somewhere. Uh, maybe this is where he's actually going. Let me take a, 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 let me check a left. If I take a left turn, in fact, this left turn, no 16 wheelers are allowed. There is actually a thing that is written that such so many times are not allowed into that street. So she takes that turn and guess what? The man breaks this traffic rule and, she, and he follows. And by this time she knows that she's being followed. She sped and made turns left, right, left, right, and, and going up and up. But the man is right behind her. She knows that she's being chased by this man. She's afraid for her life. Can you imagine if you were in that kind of a place where you were afraid for your life? You have seen the man. He looks rough. He's got bloodshot eyes. He looks like a murderer. And you are afraid of him. Oh, by God's providence, right in front of her, there's a little placard written, police station. She says, oh, thank you, God. She storms into the police station, parks her car, and jumps out of the car, runs into the in, inside into the building, and she manages to tell the policeman what is actually happening, that she's being followed. As she's explaining this, the policemen look outside, and they see the 16-wheeler really coming with speed. The man is really coming for this woman. So the police come out with their guns ready to shoot. The driver jumps out of the truck and runs straight to the woman's car. Of course, the woman is not in the car at this time. She is behind the police. The man opens the back door and yanks out a thug who had a gun and a knife. What? Yes. When the 16-wheeler at the petrol station when the woman went inside into the shop, the 16-wheeler driver, this rough-looking driver, noticed a thug, a, 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 um, um, someone who wanted to harm this lady, jump into the car and hide behind the back seat. And this man said, no, I've got to rescue this poor woman. Can you imagine the whole time the woman was running away from her savior? It's as if the woman, the, the driver, the 16-wheeler driver, as he was driving, the truck driver, as he was driving behind this woman, he must have been saying, oh, I wish you knew. Can you hear the words of Jesus in this truck driver? I wish you knew how much I want to save you, how much I want to hide you under my wings. Sometimes we run away from the rescue plan. My friends, I want you to hear the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 23. I want you to pick the emotion of a loving God in the words of Jesus, that he wants to hide us. In fact, we will never have to plead God to hide us under his wings. It is his core business to hide us. He wants to do that to hide us. I want you to realize that this is actually the first thing that God did after the sin of man. God ever wanted to be with man. 
Before Genesis chapter 3, the chapter that talks about the scene, the first scene of man, God ever wanted to, um, to, to, to camp, uh, to pitch his tent, to use a more religious term, to tabernacle with man. He, he wanted to commune with man as a friend communes with, with, with a friend. But we ran away from God, literally ran away from God. Just pick this story in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, please come with me to Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 7. From 1 to 6, it tells us of the story of the woman running out, I mean, uh, eating of the fruit that she had been told not to eat. But from verse 7, we hear what followed after that. Verse 7, I read in your hearing. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sawed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I want you to understand the picture here, my friends. Listen, Adam and Eve have sinned and the guilt and pain of their sin is hanging above them. Now they run away from a loving God. In fact, the Bible says they heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden that evening as he was coming to commune with them. Oh, do you think that God did not know that Adam and Eve had seen? God is all seeing. God knows everything that is happening. He knows when we have not been, we have not, we have not been, we have not measured up. He knows when we have fallen short. He sees everything, even things that are under the sea. God sees them. So God knew what had happened with Adam and Eve. In fact, when God walked in the garden that evening, God was not coming to condemn Adam and Eve. God was coming. I can hear God in Jesus' words saying, Oh, Adam and Eve, how much I wish to hide you under my wing. But guess what? Adam and Eve ran away from a loving God. My friends, I want you to, to realize something this, this, this afternoon. The Christian God perhaps with all due respect, different from all the other gods out there. The Christian God is a God who's always chasing. Let me say that again. The Christian God is far removed from all the other gods because he's always chasing the work of his hands, the human beings. Not to condemn them, he's not chasing them so that he can destroy them. He is chasing them so that he can protect them. He can give them a rescue plan. You know, I've not always been raised a Christian. I know that in traditional African worship system, we had to do things for our God to come. But the Christian God, we don't have to do anything for him to come. In fact, he loved us while we were yet sinners. Before we even knew about him, he was already there working behind the scenes, trying to appeal to our hearts, his goodness, bringing his goodness to us, chasing after us, not to destroy us. You know, the, the, this Bible, chapter 3, in Genesis, it tells us that Adam and Eve were hiding behind the bushes. When I was growing up, um, I was told that, you know, stories that were just being told to kids, of course, an exaggeration to scare us, that there was um, a version of the Western boogeyman. We had our own boogeyman in, in, in my tribe called Dindindi. That's a boogeyman in my tribe. So we were afraid of the bushes because we, we thought that in the, in the bushes, in, the, in behind those bushes, lurks a, a boogeyman at Dindindi. I want you to know, my friends, God knows when we go, we run away to hide behind the bushes. There's a boogeyman right there. The reason why he chases us, why he runs after us, why he walks towards us and calls, Adam, where are you? 
God already knows that we are hiding. The reason that he calls is because he knows that we are, we are, we are in danger of being destroyed by the boogeyman called the devil. And God is chasing after us so that he can, he can put us under his wings. He can hide us under his wings. Can you imagine? Please picture this in Genesis chapter 3. Here is an Adam who is running away. He doesn't want to see God because of his guilt, not because God is scary, but because he's guilty. Guilty separates man and God, not because God doesn't want to be with man, but it's just the nature of guilty. A guilty ridden man just wants to move away from God. So if that be the case, that Adam and Eve intend to, 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 to go away from God, and then God calls and Adam responds, what was it in God's call that made a man, hey, if you were running away from someone and he said, hey, where are you? Would you respond? Oh, there must have been something in the call of God that was so soothing, that was healing, that promised that we can, we can, we can repair this broken relationship. I can protect you. That made Adam to respond. God is coming at a time like this to planet Earth, he intends to heal. He intends to repair the broken relationship. He is saying to you and I this afternoon, come unto me that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. In fact, when we move from there, we hear that um, God did not just intervene that day by coming to broken human beings in Genesis chapter three, God actually said, I have to intervene more. And we are told in, in Matthew chapter, chapter one and the verses 23, the Bible says, Genesis, I mean, Matthew chapter one and the verses 23. This is the story of how Jesus was born on this planet of earth. It starts with a whole long genealogy. And then it comes to Mary and Joseph. And then Joseph knows that Mary, um, he has not touched Mary, though she's pregnant, and, she, and, and he wants to put it, put it away. Then the angel speaks to her. These are some of the words of the angel in Matthew chapter 1, that verse 23. That's the context there. Verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. My friends, what this simply means is that in Jesus, God has become man. God did not just chase us physically, did not chase the human family physically in the garden. He came, he came and became a human being. He left his divinity and was found in the form of man. There's a Bible text in Philippians chapter 3, I think, uh, chapter 2 around verse six and seven, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind? Him who thought it no robbery to be equal with God because he was like God, but he reduced himself and he was found in form of a man. Jesus, who was God, he was Yahweh. He is now God with man, Emmanuel. Guess why? The reason is Jesus has to come and suffer the pain that we suffer. When we come to him, with coronavirus, when we come to him with communicable diseases, Jesus understands the pain of communicable diseases. When we come to him with the pain of being separated from loved ones, Jesus understands the pain. Jesus knows the human, the human pain. That's why the author of the book of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who is not touched with the feelings of, of, our, of human weaknesses, of our infirmities. He is touched. So he understands. Can you imagine, my friends, that day when Jesus was walking soon after he started his ministry, he's walking into a city called Nain. You find the story in Luke chapter 7 from verse 11 to 17. You hear of the story of Jesus. Um, let me read it to you from verse 11. Luke chapter 7. Those of you that have your Bibles with you, Luke chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 11. Here it says, now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd 
And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of a mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd followed, the followed from the city was with her. When the Lord Jesus saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. My friends, we have this God who has become a human being. His reason is come and chase after human family that is going through pain and suffering. And here is a picture of a woman who is already a widow. She's suffering. She's going through the troubles of this world. She has only one son. And here the son dies. And she has the whole, a few of her friends following in this funeral procession. And thank God, Jesus is coming into the city of Nain. She, and he sees the woman coming out and he reads the situation quickly. She, he understands the pain of that woman. He has a little window into understanding God. Can you hear Jesus saying, oh, widow, do not weep. Come under my wings. I want to cover you with my wings. The Bible says, before that, the Bible says, and he was moved with compassion. We have a God who is moved with compassion when we are going through what we are going through right now. Locked away, separated from our, con from our communities. I was just talking to someone who was saying, I have a father living in the state and I cannot go, go to him. The borders are closed. And I'm, I'm worried that my father cannot cope alone. That's what we are going through at this moment in time. But our God is moved with compassion. Can you remember that story in John chapter 4? The woman who could not, who had been, who had been living in the peripheries of her social circles. She could not be allowed into the community. That's why she came. Some say that's why she came to the, to the well all alone in the afternoon in John chapter 4. Jesus could have come, could have chosen to come to see this woman in John chapter 4. Jesus could have chosen to come at a time when everyone was coming to the, to, to, to the well. But Jesus, I read into this city in Samaria and he sees that there's a woman who is all alone, no connections whatsoever. She's going through the pain of loneliness. She's doing life all alone. Maybe the choices that she had made in the past were causing her this pain and, 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 and separation. But we understand when we have a little wind of understanding who God is in the person of Jesus, that Jesus chooses to come to this woman at a time like this. Then Jesus begins a conversation. This woman's heart has been hardened by sin, by separation for a long time. So Jesus has to work out a conversation that will begin to penetrate through all those barriers, through all those prejudices, because she always has a guard up because that's what sin does. It puts a guard up. So Jesus has to work through all that guard and through that all insecurity with a very measured conversation. And finally, after Jesus has asked for water, and then this woman begins to warm up to a conversation, and Jesus says to her, Jesus answered on verse, on verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. My friends, I want you to see what's happening here. Jesus, yet again, is sending out a passionate plea to the human, to, to the human family. If only you knew how much I wish to hide you under my wings. If you knew who it is who is asking you, at a time like this, I hear Jesus' voice. If you knew who it is that is asking you, you would have come to him. Jesus wants to hide us under the wings. I, I hear of the story in John chapter 8 of a woman caught in the act of adultery, and the religion wanted to condemn her. Those people that are self-righteous wanted to condemn her. They bring her to the temple to be stoned 
thank God, here is a little window of God. We see Jesus waiting there. I don't have time to tell you of all the things that Jesus does, but Jesus writes on the ground. I don't know. Some say Jesus was writing the sins of the people that had brought this woman to be condemned. And Jesus reminds them that you are also sinners. You are not worthy to condemn this woman. Only Jesus alone is worthy to judge us. And none can judge the other. That's the problem sometimes with religion. We can judge each other. But when we come to Jesus, his interest is not in judging us. His interest is in, is in covering us. This woman has come to the right place where Jesus can cover her and protect her. We hear in the story, as the story goes on, hey, but before I get there, there's this thing that is inviting me to say. Some preacher once said, their sins had been written in the ground. Thank God. God's law was written and their names are written in the palm of his hand. Their very names were written in the palms of his hand. Here it is, my friends, as we come back to this, to the story of the woman in John chapter 8. Jesus, for the first time, picture this, from, from morning, as they were dragging her to the temple, I can imagine all the, the, the derogatory terms they would have used to, to pull down this woman. She's only a shell of a human being by this moment in time. Maybe even the children and rowdy children in the streets calling a prostitute, stone her, hallowed, stone her. But for the first time, I have this picture of a woman who's, who's facing down with guilt and shame. Then she hears, for the first time, a gentle voice, woman. She can't believe her ears. No, that can't be me. Because you, you don't quite get it in the, in the, in the, in the English translation. Because in the original translation, Jesus could have been saying, lady, a dignified way of calling. Because Jesus is interested in a relationship, a saving relationship, a protecting relationship. Woman, where are they? Where are they that condemn you? She can't believe. Who? Me? Yes, woman, I mean you. Neither do I condemn you. I want to shelter you under my wings. Friends, I want to tell you that it is still the same story right now. That God wants to shelter us under his wings. As we go through what we're going through, it doesn't matter what we have done. Maybe guilt and shame might be saying I'm not worthy of God's protection. I, not me. God will not accept me. No, 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 my friend. Jesus has shown us right here. If he had regard of that, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. He could use me even a sinner. He's interested in even saving you. He is saying, if only you knew how much I want to hide you. Maybe someone is saying, Pastor Tappy, Pastor Tappy, are you sure that God wants to save us? Are you very sure that God wants to protect us? Why is it that there are people who have accepted Jesus as their personal savior and they are going through pain? I want you to know, my friends, in fact, I'm going to say more about this question in my, little sem in my next sermon next, next week. But let, me, let it suffice to say to you that soon and very soon, Jesus is going to end all this, all this um, virus, not just the virus of corona, but the virus of sin that is dragged with it death and disaster and catastrophe and all these broken relationships and all the pain that we see, it has been dragged into our lives because of sin. It is this that Jesus, this is the main thing that Jesus wants to protect us from, that he wants to hide us under his wings from. Very soon, let me just show you this promise that is found in First Peter chapter 3 and the verse is 10. Here it is. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Let me tell you, my friends, this text does not suggest to us that God wants to burn people. That's not his desire. He doesn't want to do that. 
He wants to, to burn the earth and the works of the earth and finish and purify this earth. He wants to end pain and suffering. That's the meaning of judgment, that God wants to wipe it all away, that he can give us a world. He can hide us under his wings. That's what God wants to do, my friends. So why doesn't he just do it? Let me read to you verse 9 of that text. Verse 9, I have it right here. First, Second Peter chapter 3, and the verse is 10. Here it is. I read in your hearing. Second Peter chapter 3, and the verse is 10, as we go towards the closing. I want to tell you a story in a moment. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's the one that we've just, we've just, we've just read. It is this day that will end all sin, that will end all pain. But, be, but before that, there is a text before that, that is verse 9. Let me read it in your hearing. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some counted slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. The reason why he cannot do it. Can you imagine if Jesus were to intervene right now, right here, intervene to come and, and just imagine Jesus comes, he breaks the eastern skies, rolls back the sky as, as, as a scroll, and here he comes with all his glory, the glory of the Father, the glory of the angels, and, the glory, and, and his own glory, because Jesus comes with triple glory. No man can see him, can see this glory unless we are changed. But then there is a group of people that are not yet changed that will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and the verses 8 says that that's when the lawless one shall be revealed, him who shall be destroyed by the breath of his coming, by the brightness of his coming. So when Jesus comes, he will be his presence, his glory cannot coexist with sin. So before he does that, before he comes to remove all sin, he wants to make sure we have accepted the antidote for sin, and that is the blood of Jesus. He's waiting. So he's calling. He's just calling right now. He's saying, oh, as many as can come, please, before that time come, please, please, come under my wings. I want to protect you. I want to save you. I started by the story of a woman that ran away from a savior. Let me tell you my own personal experience with running away. I would have been around 10 years of age, somewhere around there. My mother had a friend, God bless her soul. She's still alive, I still talk to her even to this very day. She's back home in Zimbabwe. And mom would always send me to her friend. I hated going to this woman's friend, to this woman's house. I did it with a passion. No, 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 it's not about the woman. She was really sweet and good. Um, it's because between our two houses, there was yet another house where there was this, um, if you guys know anything about dogs, there's a particular dog that was bred in Zimbabwe, then known as Rhodesia. The early English settlers that came had bred these dogs to fight against the lions as they were going out into the farms. These were bushy areas back in the late 1800s uh, with a lot of lions. So the early settlers bred a special dog called the Rhodesian Ridgeback. Really, and there were stories floating around about the Rhodesian Ridgebacks eating little children. Sometimes these stories were told to scare us. And I was scared about this. I was scared of this Rhodesian Ridgeback. People. There was a man who had one of those, and his house was between my house and the house where my mother used to like sending me to. And this would happen almost on a weekly basis. Mom go says, "Go and get this. Go and take this." Every time I would come to this, get to this house, the fence. I would stand at the corner of this fence, and I would find, for some reason, maybe the dog actually smelled that I was coming. I don't know, but every time I got to this corner, it would be there waiting for me. And in my little young mind, I didn't understand that, oh, this actually little thing is within a cage, is within the fence. I would start running outside the fence on the pathway while it's running inside the fence. And I would run and I would get to the gate 
of the house. It was always closed. And I would run past the gates to the other corner and then the dog, dog would stop, but I would still run. I wish somebody had told me as a young little boy that, hey, you are safe from this dog. You don't have to run because it's caged. I'll come back from that house, find the dog waiting for me, chases me, but it's within the fence and I'm outside. And this happened for a long time. Then one particular day, I got to this corner, the dog chased me. When I got to the gate, <laughs> the gate was open. My goodness, I think I died for a split second when I discovered that the gate was open. But something, I don't know what they talk about, this thing called adrenaline, uh, you know, flight or fight mode. I went into a flight mode. I, I, start, I was literally flying. But there was a voice. There was a voice from within the house. <laughs> I normally joke and say, I must have been flying faster than the speed of sound because I could hear that he was saying something. The old man from this house was saying something, but I, I was too, too busy fleeing that I didn't hear what he was saying. And as I was running, I hit my foot against something. If you know anything about, about, about uh, falling in full flight, you don't just fall down, you start by flying and you land on, your, on all fours. My hands were bruised. My knees were bruised. I think I was bruised on the forehead. I got blood all over, got dirt in my mouth. And, oh, I'm thinking, now I'm just waiting. This is the end of me. I'm waiting for it to just devour me. In a split second, the dog is not expecting to catch up with me, so it rams into me. But with this little mind that's not like mine without intellect, it thinks I'm attacking it. It just turns around and whippers away. And it runs away. And I remain there for a few more moments until I feel a hand on my shoulder. Stand up, my son, it's the old man from the, from the house. I have been shouting to you to not run. I've been shouting to you because I've been wanting to protect you. This dog was involved in an accident and its teeth were knocked out. Its, its, its um, jaws, had gone askew, it will not harm you. Trust in me, I've been wanting to protect you. All this long I've been running, was I hurt? Yes, I was hurt. I was hurt from running away, even from a voice that wanted to protect me. God is sending out his last message at this moment in time, a message where he wants to protect us, where he wants to give us hope, the hope of his coming, but he's just waiting for one more who will say, Lord, I'm here. I want to be protected under your wings. I don't know whether it's you, my friend. It could be you this afternoon. You're saying, God, protect me under your wings. Soon and very soon, Jesus is coming to whisk his children away before he makes this, this, this earth anew. Wouldn't you accept him? As he says, now he's not weeping for just Jerusalem, he's weeping for the whole world. He's saying, all oh, earth, all oh, earth, how much I wish to hide you under my wings. This is Jesus' plea. Maybe there's someone here who's watching from wherever you're watching, you're saying, I want Jesus' protection. And if you have never actually made this kind of a decision, at a time like this, when the earth is being attacked by this virus, you're saying, Jesus, I want to be protected under your wings. If this is you, just text us and we'll get in touch with you. But as for now, I want you to, to bow your heads with me as I conclude in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for every soul that has been within the sound of my voice. 
that you are reaching out to us as human beings, including me. You are chasing after us, not to destroy us. You are chasing after us to give us hope, to protect us and keep us under your wings. Father, may we be found, may we respond to that sweet small voice. There's someone who is listening right now, their heart is stirred. It is because the Holy Spirit is speaking into their minds. Father, just ask that you may protect us and give us hope through this. There is no other hope, Father. Everything else on this planet of Earth is just bend aid. You have the antidote for this virus, not just this virus of, of corona, but the virus of sin. You want to remove this corona and give us a crown of victory. I pray, Father, that everyone here and those that are making this decision for the first time, that you may write our names in the book of life and protect us under your wings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.